I don't know if you've heard, but O.J. Simpson is on Twitter. <laughs> he made his social media debut back in 2019 and made minor news when he tweeted a video of himself ahead of the first presidential debates. There he was, in his living room, feet kicked up, commenting on the overcrowded field of Democrats, just like the rest of us. Since then, OJ has used Twitter mostly to complain about his fantasy football team and to dispense unironic advice to current NFL players on the virtues of keeping their cool. And he does all of this with this blank affability that simultaneously announces and ignores the chilling fact that he is that OJ Simpson. Now, in case the 90s weren't actually 10 years ago and you're too young to remember, <laughs> O.J. Simpson is a former football star, film actor, and product spokesman who, despite that resume, is probably most famous for brutally, but allegedly, murdering two people in June of 94 his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and Ron Goldman, a friend who'd happened to be at her home that night. The spectacle that followed was peak Los Angeles, complete with paparazzi, SC football, a freeway chase, and even a Kardashian. Trial coverage was ubiquitous, seeping into our conversation and entertainment from SNL all the way down to my eighth grade talent show where I wrote and performed an ill-advised but hella tight parody of Aerosmith's Walk This Way entitled Run OJ. <laughs> Even if you didn't follow the trial every day, you knew when the verdict was due. And no matter where you were at that moment, especially in LA, you were tuned in to catch the finale of this year-long Capodian true crime saga. My high school was no exception. For context, my high school was literally straight out of a Bret Easton Ellis novel. It was located across town in a suburb miles away from where I lived. So each day, I took a bus from the set of California Love to the set of California Dreams. I remember my first year there, I missed a week of school because of the 1992 LA riots. I returned to the relief and awe of an all white classroom and confirmed that yes, I was still alive and yes, just over the hill, they, which is to say we, really were, burn that motherfucker down. <laughs> For them, it had all been rumor, something to do with the rap lyrics they weren't yet allowed to listen to. After all, the goal of the suburban, school, of suburban schools like mine, the goal of the suburbs in general, was to escape the unpleasantness of the urban, to keep such darkness at arm's length which made it all the more surprising when on the morning of the OJ verdict, a TV appeared in the school courtyard, seemingly on its own, as though the trial itself had become sentient and would not be denied our rapt attention. There had been no announcement from the faculty, no collective debrief, which was to be sure a ballsy move. Because not only was this a trial about a horrific double murder, there were larger social implications as well. It had become a referendum on the LAPD, the de facto antagonist of the riots three years prior, and the antagonist long before that, if you were black in Los Angeles. And because OJ was black, and Nicole a pretty young blonde, both the relationship and the crime itself ignited familiar fears of black male sexuality and its constant threat to the virtue of white women. 
And so the trial threw an often uncomfortable spotlight on the simmering tensions between black and white Angelinos, who literally and figuratively occupied separate spaces within the same city. This separation was made evident at my school that morning as we gathered around the TV. And it wasn't until that last hushed moment, as we all leaned in to hear the verdict, that I realized that I was surrounded by the school's few black students. All of us huddled together in our own exclusive chocolate pocket. And when the foreman read the verdict, fumbling OJ's full name, we, the jury, in the above title action, find the defendant, Orange, or Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder, man, that chocolate pocket exploded into cheers and high fives, yelling like our team had scored the winning touchdown, which it had, in a manner of speaking. We'd all been watching a game, even if we hadn't always flexed our team allegiance. And on that morning, while the black students rejoiced along with black spectators around the country, I could sense those crowded around us throwing their head backs in guttural dismay and a newfound disgust. Though we'd all been classmates, friends, black and white, just moments before, our divergent responses had revealed a potential riff that had been there all along. My triumphant posture the rest of the day was met with dirty looks from cold blue eyes. One friend in biology class just turned and shook his head at me and asked how I could be so happy that a murderer had gotten away with it. At 14, I'd lacked the solid sense of history to satisfactorily answer that question. What I suspected, however, was that if he had been black, he wouldn't have had to ask it in the first place. What I now understand is that my real crime, to the extent that I too was on trial that day, was that I hadn't held up my end of the bargain. Because like Tony, the token brother from California Dreams, my role was to remind the audience that black people existed, not to remind them why there was only one in the cast. Of course, it's not the only time I have failed to play my part correctly. You see, I'm often called upon to serve as a credit to my race. I check a lot of boxes after all. I grew up hood adjacent, the child of a hardworking black single mother. I was a bona fide good kid in a mad city who spent more time in the Inglewood Library than in these Inglewood streets. I've collected a handful of college degrees on my way to becoming a college professor myself, where today I provide living proof that black academia is alive and well. Moreover, I'm evidence that the slings and arrows aimed at our young black men are dodgeable and that they too can emerge victorious at the other end. On occasion, I've been asked to talk to someone's troubled son or wayward nephew struggling with school and home. Oh, I just know if he talked to a brother like you, their parents insist attempting to tap into my apparent reserves of black excellence. I've had opportunities to speak before groups of young black men to be a guide of sorts, to teach them how they too can walk through this life a proper representative of the black community. But inevitably, what ensues is a performance of sorts one that's required if I'm to garner some semblance of credibility among these brothers. The act demands that I <clears throat> add a little bass to my voice <laughs> and that I slow it down to a speed that connotes my cool. But the truth is, in reality, I'm not cool at all. 
Despite my ability to speak in front of large groups, I'm actually mad awkward. I lack the confidence, the semi-sexual swagger, the thick skin, the toughness, and let's be honest, the height of what comes to mind when you think of the quintessential black man. Even before I was shipped off to school in the suburbs, I was always a little, an odd little black boy or sensitive, they used to say with just a hint of pity. I was too into my drawings and Nick and Knight reruns and making movies in my own head to bother with playing outside. And so I never really learned the language of outside. My poor mother just couldn't understand why I hadn't wanted to hang out with the neighborhood kids and throw a ball around and sweat and shit talk like a normal boy. The truth is, it was often because I dreaded, and still dread, the incredulous looks from my own people. The lip-smacking disappointment that follows the wrong response. That skepticism reserved for interlopers and carpetbaggers. I mean, that pained face when I tell black people that I hadn't been watching Power. And so I dance as fast as I can, learn the lines as soon as possible, and do my best not to break character. I mean, I can't let these brothers know that I thought Black Panther was just all right. <laughs> that I refused to watch Roseanne without Roseanne. <sighs> that no. I haven't canceled Kanye West, and that, if anything, I have upgraded my subscription. <laughs> that's right, yeah, still, that's right, that's right. That while I love hip-hop music, if you catch me alone mouthing lyrics to myself, there's a pretty good chance that what I'm actually singing is poor unfortunate souls from Disney's The Little Mermaid. That while, no, I haven't seen Power, I have seen every episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I've been to more bar mitzvahs than barbershops. And when you casually ask me about that game last night, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because while you had basketball practice back in high school, I had dress rehearsal for the music man. And so my interactions with black strangers, men in particular, are fraught with this attempt to hide. And my relationships with black people are often hindered by this feeling that I could have my membership revoked at any moment. I'm reminded of, a Halloween, of Halloween back in 2008. There were these posters hanging all around of then-candidate Obama with the caption, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? An allusion to the 1960 film in which a, girl, a white girl brings her black fiancé home to meet her supposedly liberal parents. What they all learn in the end is that it's easy to have an open mind behind closed doors. It's a different story when that color line is in your face, in your neighborhood, in your classroom, in your home. That Halloween, I'd gone to this house party thrown by a friend of a friend. As usual, my costume was some configuration of what I already owned. In this case, a shirt, tie, gloves, and a do-rag that I wore as a mask to cover my whole face. Just who or what was I supposed to be, I don't know and neither did anyone else at the party, though they all offered their guesses. Nor did they know that I was black. My skin was hidden after all, and the name Dustin certainly didn't give anything away. <laughs> but once I removed my glasses and lifted my mask enough to enjoy a slice of pizza, I was met with everyone's poorly hidden reassessment of who I was, and moreover, who they were in relation to me. 
I'm not saying that I suddenly had to drink from a separate stack of solo cups, but greetings of dude were immediately replaced with bro. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Guesses about my costume now included mm, the black Zorro, or the black invisible man, or the black Spider-Man in that one scene. Exposed, I had ceased to be just another party guest. I had taken on a familiar role, one that was being decided for me. And maybe that's what it means to be black in this society, is to have your part handed to you without an audition, to be cast in a narrative that somebody else has written for themselves. Nearly 30 years after the LA riots, sparked by the excessive beating of Rodney King at the hands and feet of the LAPD, and the subsequent acquittal of the officers involved, we find ourselves in a new renaissance of police brutality against black victims. Even before the summer of George Floyd, social media made it easier, even mandatory, to report and to comment on the growing list of incidents and to comment on the comments until we lost ourselves in a spiral of virtue signals. In recent years, as the names of victims racked up, Oscar Grant, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Walter Scott, just to name a few. I once again join the righteous online noise of black rage, resentment, and fear. And once again, as on the morning of the OJ verdict, I was admonished for my response by white friends who were uncomfortable with my tone. One asked whether my anti-police posts were helpful. Another wondered if I'd stop to think about how my anger made him feel. Conversely, on other occasions, I've been condemned by black folks online for my insufficient indignation and for, my breaking, and for breaking political ranks dismissed as just another casualty of the sunken place for my lukewarm stance on the community threat du jour. I often find myself at the mercy of someone else's expectations and urged to make a choice to follow a prescribed set of cultural criteria to draw a definitive line. But, like Buffy at the end of season seven, <laughs> torn between Angel and Spike, I have to learn to reject my confinement and to see my life as more than a reflection of the lives of others. I advise you all to do the same because this identity crisis is not mine alone. In the meantime, try not to be offended by everything you hear, every post you read, and to immediately see what makes you uncomfortable as an affront to your existence. Because no matter what, if you search just a little harder, you can always find something worse to hate on the internet. After all, O.J. Simpson is on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>